All right, so we cranked up the heat a little bit. We're gonna give a little fire and brimstone. We'll be here about two hours. Get comfortable. Do you feel the insistence of God? I'm just kidding. All right, so a little less than two weeks ago was the 20th anniversary of my ordination to the diaconate. I know, I look way too young to have been ordained for 20 years, but here we are. I share this anniversary because one of my favorite stories shared in a sermon was told that day by my sponsoring bishop, the Right Reverend Peter James Lee, the 12th Bishop of the Diocese of Virginia. Bishop Lee served as the bishop for from 1985 to 2009 for over 20 years. It was at the time and continued to be one of the largest dioceses in the Episcopal Church, much like ours here in Massachusetts. The ordination took place at the National Cathedral. There were 19 of us being ordained. And as Bishop Lee stood in the pulpit, he shared his own story of becoming a bishop. He was serving as rector of Chapel of the Cross in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And he was on the slate in Virginia, which he felt was a pretty big accomplish accomplishment just to be on that slate. So the afternoon came and the votes rolled in and the different measures came as to which one and which round and then the name was his. So who does he call the very first person? His mom. Phone rings, mom picks up. Hey mom, guess what? The results are in and I have just been elected the 12th Bishop of the Diocese of Virginia. Mom, proud mom reaction. That is wonderful, Peter. But did you hear the news that your brother was just elected the senior warden at St. Michael's and All Angels in Dallas? <laughs> he looked directly at the 19 of us and said, no one in this room will ever see you as their priest or church leader or a spiritual giant. They love you. They raised you up and supported you in your faith. They know you better than anyone. They are your people. But you will not be their spiritual leader. They just don't see you that way. You can imagine the guffaws coming from all of the family members sitting in the pews going, yeah, that's true. You'll never be our spiritual leader. What a great story from one of the great spiritual leaders of our times. So whenever I think about today's gospel and the inability of those in Jesus' hometown to see Jesus as he was, the divine light of the Messiah among them, I'm struck by Bishop Lee's story. Is that all that's really going on in this text? I mean, as Jesus says, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin in their own house. Your people, will they struggle to let you fully grow into your potential? That fullness of who you are called to be. So is their reaction to Jesus to be just expected? Maybe. But the sentence that pulls me up short over and over again is this. They took offense at him. They took offense. As soon as they realized who Jesus was, they moved from being astounded by his teachings to taking offense that he could even presume to claim some authority or wisdom among them. They were holding so tightly to their perceived notions of who Jesus was in respect to his family and where he came from, whatever he did in middle school. They couldn't see the truth of the miracle before them, 
of the divine love and good news being preached and taught. I love the bookend of emotions in these very few verses. We start with these astounded, blown away listeners who move to a fence, which in turn leaves Jesus amazed at their unbelief. Astound, offense, amazed. The lack of belief ultimately just limited the power of Jesus to have any impact. And it was such a recalibration moment for him, amazed at their unbelief. I don't think he could quite register it, even understanding that it might be a reality. But, but he's been going. The first five ver- verses, first five chapters of Mark have been all about Jesus coming into his ministry from baptism, from calling the apostles to going out and preaching and teaching and healing. And then there's the reality check of going home. This is one of the first places where we see those rooted assumptions that people have blocking the power of God's love to heal and be spread. And so what does Jesus do next in the last half of this text that we read today? Okay, disciples, your turn. This is the moment. Jesus turns to the disciples and says, I am sending you out, I am calling you forth, and I'm giving you the authority to teach and preach and heal. But there are a few things I need you to understand. Take nothing. Stay where you start. And then when it's time, dust off your feet and go. So I want to hold up those three for a second. First, Jesus says, take very little. And whenever we hear this text, I think we think very much about what we would carry on a trip, what we would need, the extra toothbrush for your friend who forgets one, the snack bag. I mean, have you seen the snack bags that moms carry? We carry a big old fat snack bag. All the things. That's the first thing we think of. But I want to hold up for a minute. What if we think about Jesus saying, go lightly, go without your baggage. What are the other baggages in our life that we carry and hold on to? I think about, do not worry, I'm not going into politics. I think about though, after the debate last week, that after that, all these conversations started brewing and I could feel the anxiety rising up in me that we all have such strong feelings about what is going on in the world and the very things that divide us. And we have a lot of at stake in what we hold. And so in these conversations, they can feel very weighted. We all bring a lot of baggage to conversations about what is happening in the world and a lot of assumptions that can keep us from being present to doing this work in the Christian faith. The second thing Jesus says is to stay until, stay where you start, stay until you leave. And I go, what does that even mean, stay until you leave? Well, we always stay until we leave. But it wasn't uncommon when you were to go and travel to stay somewhere, you would stay until you found a better place to stay. Somewhere that had better food or better linens or, you know, had more cable vision to watch. You would stay where there was a bigger and better deal. And what Jesus says is no, go and stay right where you've landed and do the work you're called to do in that moment with those people. Don't be looking for where you can get to next that might be better. If you've ever been talking to somebody at a cocktail party, this may not happen to any of you because you're super cool, but I'm not super cool. And so sometimes when I'm talking to somebody at a cocktail party, I can see them like looking past me for who can I talk to that is not this person. That is what Jesus is saying. Please don't do that. Go in, be present, stay. 
but as we see in Jesus' experience in his hometown, people don't always receive the good news we want to offer and share as Christians. And in that moment, we need to know when it's time to dust off our feet and move on. It's okay to say, this isn't happening. Because what we understand so fully in this text, in Jesus' moment in his hometown, is that when there is great unbelief, it doesn't matter how strong your belief is and how deep your love of God is, those people are not ready to sit and be in the midst of that love. You have to just move on, and that is okay. This isn't small work. And it isn't easy being called to share the good news of the Christian faith, but as the disciples were sent out two by two, going together, because we don't do it alone, we're reminded that it's important work in all of us in our own faiths are called to it. There's a great piece from an Annie Dillard book called Teaching a Stone to Talk, and she writes, on the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest, uh, foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, making up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It's madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense. Or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. She isn't wrong. People may take offense at this Christian life. It is dangerous, living a life without baggage, staying through hard conversations when we might see things very differently, and being humble enough to move on when folks aren't ready or willing to receive this good news. Flares, life preservers, helmets, they aren't a bad idea. Today, we are baptizing Chimamanda China and Oscar James. And we love Baptism Sundays. We love the opportunity to gather and remember what this work and life of being a Christian is about. We remember the covenant and we say those promises again and we are renewed and we thank everyone who's baptized in our life for giving us that opportunity. It's a gift to celebrate these moments. It is that moment to remember and embrace a call given to each of us in the promises, like those disciples are being sent out into the world, meeting folks where they are, lugging as little of baggage and assumptions as possible, and understanding that sometimes we will need to dust off our feet and keep moving. But maybe, just maybe, we could throw in a helmet for good measure in doing this dangerous, amazing work. I think Annie would insist. Amen. <laughs>